Well, we're, we're small in number today, but that's okay. You know why? Because two. When two or more are gathered together, he's here in the midst. So I'm claiming that promise, and I would ask that you all please take out your Bible. We have more than two, so I'm happy, I'm happy with that, and I, I'm ready to receive a blessing um, as we finish up in this epistle of James. Uh, is the Sabbath School quarterly title, and we're in lesson number 12. Um, I want to do a very, very brief recap of, uh, we did the first six questions, and then we ended up on number seven. So um, we did say that uh, covetousness is the most common, and yet it's also the most lightly regarded sin that exists in our churches today. I, I kind of found that surprising because, like I said, I thought it was maybe breaking the Sabbath or something else, but I would have never thought of all ten, um, the most common yet the most lightly regarded that exists in our churches today is covetousness. So um, it is a topic worth examining, and um, we also talked about um, that God defines covetousness in relation to idolatry. Um, having this form of uh, godliness, de denying the power thereof. We also talked about the question is, is it impossible for men and women to keep the law of God and also have a love for money? Is that a possibility? That was a, this is review and I'm going over really fastly. Uh, but we talked about no, right? You, love of money is a key word. To have money, to be used to bless others, not a sin, not a, not a problem. There's a distinction, and the Bible's really clear about having the love of something and having a means. Were there rich people in the Bible? Amen. Were they using it for selfish purposes? No. So those men of God, there are... There are men of God who can be wealthy um, and still be faithful to the Lord, but none that will have a love for the money in and of itself and still be able to keep the law of God. We learned that last time. Um, okay, so now we'll just jump right into, um, we did talk about in question six, the Lord abhors covetousness in, uh, in his people. Um, and he does give us some solemn warnings. Um, I really feel that covetousness to me is, uh, we talked about it being an insult to God because we are um, looking for something more than that which the Lord has blessed us with. Um, having a discontented heart uh, for not being satisfied um, with what the Lord has given us and wanting yet something else. Um, I did bring up the example last time of Eve um, where she was discontented with her position because we talked about the eyes being open as if God. So having a power, they were given already a tree, that they, any tree that they can eat from, but there was one forbidden tree that they were not to eat from was she discontented? It was a form of wanting or having a desire for something else other than what the Lord has given uh, you. Um, Lucifer, he had a high position of, of the angels and then yet wanting to be in the position, coveting the position that the father shared with the son. It wasn't good enough. It wa he wanted more. And... We, we know how that story ended. But harboring that dissatisfaction, that discontent, why, am, why is this person always getting the blessings? Is the Lord not hearing me? And then now doubting is creeping in. Um, coveting and having that strong desire for that which does not belong to you. Okay, now we're going to go ahead um, and jump right into number seven. And this is dealing with the story of Achan. And we can find this story in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. 
It's actually a long story, and we're not going to have time to read the whole thing because I think some of us were pretty familiar with the story of Achan. And Joshua chapter 7, we're going to look specifically at two verses. Well, maybe I should back up. Okay, let's back up to 19 at least. I won't go through the beginning, but 19 says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. So going on to 21, pay attention because this is what answers the question. When I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So if you look at just that one verse, 21, you see a progression. Do you guys see? There's like three steps that took place that led to it. So first, when he what? He saw. Did Eve not see a fruit that looked good? By, okay, so he beheld, he saw. It's not going to stop there. I think that's where we go wrong. If we stay there and fixate on this thing, this desired thing, instead of bringing it back and saying, Lord, if you would have me to have this thing, right? But we want to bring that thing to ourselves and we leave God out of it. Instead of praying to him, if I desire something, Lord, it's going to have to be you that gives it to me, not my own doing, right? But then this is where Achan messes up, puts God aside. He wants this and he's going to make it happen that he acquires this thing that he desires. So he saw, and then what happened? Then he coveted these items, and behold, now he acts on the covetousness. Now there's an action that takes place. All sin originates where? You don't just do something. I tell my kids all the time, you don't just do it. You thought about it first. It may be even but a brief inkling or brief moment that it crosses your mind, but you, it starts with an idea. Um, and then you act on it. So he acted on it. So he saw it, he coveted, action took place, right? Okay, and then um, if we, so his great sin was covetousness. But let's look at uh, note number four. Can someone read note four? Talk about seeing the frown of God. Note number four. I believe it starts with a concealed golden wedge, yes. correct? So it says here, a concealed golden wedge and a Babylonish garment troubled the entire camp of Israel. The frown of God was brought upon the people because of the sin of one man. Thousands were slain upon the field of battle because God would not bless and prosper a people among whom there was even one sinner, one who had transgressed his word and that makes me think about even Adam mm. and stemming from that we have what we see in the world today you know um, murder uh, strife uh, divorce uh, and I could go on and on and on in confession um, me personally I used to think that if someone close to me or in the church if they were to sin that's their business. That's between them and God. And I'm seriously wrong. Because when you think about it, I wish I had this quote, but there was, um, I read where she talks about no sin. I think she's talking in relation to your actually your home circle, the mother, the father, the children. No sin can be done without an effect being felt with someone else, another family member. Like, it cannot happen. Even if it's a secret sin and you don't know about it, did they know in the, in the camp? Did they know why? They're probably scratching their head like, we covered all our bases, we're doing everything. Why Slaughter. What's going on? So at that point, I said, you know, it's not something where I can close my eye blind to and say there's sin in the camp. That's between them and God. 
I had to really check my thinking and say, okay, am I my brother's keeper? If there's sin in the camp, let me go. There's a way, there's a step. You go to that individually, individual, and confront the situation. Not on Facebook, not openly, not gossip and tell that person and that person about what they did. But it is our business concerning spiritual things because it has an effect and it will spread like wildfire. So it starts with one little spark. Satan just needs a foothold, just a, a wedge, an entering wedge to get in to bring down a whole congregation and to bring disunity, backbiting and backsliding. And so you felt the effect. I didn't eat the fruit. Eve did. But are we still affected by that today? You, it's our business. You right? know, it's interesting that you say that, uh, Sister Washington, because, you know, I feel a personal responsibility to my brothers and sisters uh, because of that, the this, this same matter, you know, uh, to lead a more surrendered life to Christ and, 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 and to have, you know, more devotion and to uh, desire to live righteously, you know, because I have a responsibility, you know, not only to Christ, but to my fellow man, even here, my church family, you know, because from my own personal experience, you know, you know, I, we know what we do, you know, let's be real. And, you know, um, I, I, I have personally in the past, you know, have not lived a godly life and I've come to church and, you know, I've seen the impact of what I have uh, transgressed during the week upon my church family. But I, I've learned through the mercy of God, mm. you know, that, you know, I have a responsibility, we, we you know. We have a responsibility, to, you know, we are our brother's keepers, in other words, amen? And my justification for not getting involved in other people's doings and was we all read the same books. They've been in this faith longer than me. I feel like so new that I can't ever be in a position to correct someone or to reprove them with a thus saith the Lord because after all, I'm not telling them or teaching them anything they don't already know. But this is where my rebuke came in. You're not teaching them anything that they don't already know. Don't think so highly of yourself. You're not educating them. You're reminding them and you're pleading with them and praying with them. It's not like you're going to them and you're giving this new information, but what was the children of Israel's problems? They forgot. Time and time again, the Lord would bring them and answer their prayer miracles. They would forget. And so are we not present day, okay, so are we forgetful of where the Lord has brought us out thus far? So our job, my job, is to remind with a, and encourage and admonish I feel like we talk more about the, the divisions and the problems and the doctrine and uh, um, controversies of the doctrine. Are you a this person? Are you, and we start to classify and break up our people into categories. Um, but why aren't we admonishing and when we see a brother stumbling, why are we not going to them and encouraging them and saying, look, I, I have a concern for you. Christ went to his people with tears that was his reproof but we sometimes a way in the way in the which the tactless way in the which that we come to someone may be a uh, um, not received as readily because we maybe we need to have tears filled in our eyes when we pray for them and snatch them out of the hell fires as if their soul depends on it because it does brother i have um just a comment regarding that the way to really be able to help someone is by not being a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. For example, if I'm guilty of different things, if I haven't seen the, the beam that is in my eye, mm -hmm. then I'm in no position to cast the moat out of your eye. You see what I'm saying? So in the theme of are we our brother's keeper, yes, we are. But we also have to understand that in order for us to have any power in our words, it can't be hypocrisy. You know, Desire of Ages talks about um, 
how the reason why Christ, his words were so powerful, it's because he lived according to the words that he spoke. But if you're saying all these different things and you're not living it, your words will have no power. Mm. You know, the Bible says the, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, that's the thing is we have to be doing right. And to be our brother's keeper, part of it is also living in a manner in which our prayers can be heard before God. Amen. Yeah, I was reading something about um, your, you have to bring your life in alignment for that which you pray. But then I also think about, so does that mean I have to have, um, be, I guess, be perfect and be flawless before I can address something to my breath? So that kind of brings up another question is, at what point can we come to each other and pray? Does that mean I have not, I don't have my own struggles, um, that I'm, all my character defects are gone because that kept me quiet for a long time thinking that I was in not a position because after all, look at my spots, look I th at my I sins. I think the, so the main thing is you have to spend time in prayer yourself before you go to before. someone else and bring right. out their flaws. It's not okay. that, oh, we've arrived in, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. We have to spend the time spirit. with God before we can bring mm -hmm. Anything okay. before anybody. Before anybody. Amen. Amen. I agree with that, sister. And I think sometimes it it we have to consider how we're bringing it. Um, maybe if we start off with the fact that you know I'm coming to you be in in humility and mm. and not that I think I have it all together, but right. you know we were just um, going through some questions in my son's lesson on prayer and. There's a Bible verse that says that when you bring your gift to the altar and you, and you remember that, mm -hmm. not that you have a ought with your brother, but that your brother has ought with you. That's, diff that's powerful. You yeah. have to leave it there and Amen. you have to go. And that takes humility. Yes, it does. Because it's easy to say, well, that's their issue. Mm -hmm. They should be coming to mm -hmm. me. And um, it's, it's interesting because Elder Shelton brought that very point out last night mm. that, and I didn't know this, that he and his brother, for 20 years, they didn't associate mm. because they had this issue, mm. you know. And um, after 20 years, he humbled himself and he went to his brother and they reconciled, you know. And that's what it takes. Mm. It, it takes a degree of humility Amen. to do that. And I was telling my son, you know, all, the Lord asks us to do that because he's trying to um, give us the character that's going to fit us for heaven. And those are the things that are going to allow us to see ourselves. If we are reserved to do that, then that should tell us we have, we have an issue. Amen. And God wants to humble us and allow us to help others as well. And we're not going to be um, running from each other in heaven. You know, when we have, I believe there's a, you know, in our... There's not going to be, well, here's so-and-so. I don't really mesh well with them, so let me come over here to this side of heaven. Are you crazy? Right. We're not going to be divided in heaven. We're going to be in perfect harmony and perfect unity that we will love to fellowship at the feet of Christ and then also with each other. It's going to be not an exclusive, cliquish, what do you think the heaven is going to be? We're going to run from each other? I, d I don't believe that. I have a hard time saying I won't have to see that person. You won't be in heaven. If you have any reserve of having to stay away from somebody, here is training camp. Get these issues out now because probation hasn't yet closed, but it's closing as we speak. So this is the time, uh, the day of atonement, we're supposed to be making one with God first, right? Once we make one with God, we're also going to each other. And ironing out those differences or we won't enter those pearly gates. Brother. I just want to piggyback off of her comment. It, um, it made me think of uh, Jacob and Esau. Oh. So when they finally met up again, you notice that Jacob was very humble right. towards his brother. He did some praying. Because he remembers, <laughs> you know, he remembered that his brother had ought with him. But that was after wrestling with God mm -hmm. and truly gaining Examining the victory. Yourself, he was, he was no longer called Jacob at that time. He was Israel. He, was, he was overcomer. And for us, I think, 
you know, we have to understand that we are, you know, as Christ said, when you read the Gospels, there's, there's no, one that, no one that is good. You know, he always gave glory to the Father. And we have to understand that in us, we don't have any good thing in us. We have to allow Christ to truly soften and, and subdue our hearts so that if we do have an issue and we do have to talk to our brother, it's not coming uh, from a place of pride or anything like that. That, you know, it, it'll be a humble and a very contrite spirit. Amen. Amen. Go with me uh, to, in your Bibles, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if I can get a reader for 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 10, please. This is a common, a common text that a lot of us hear quoted, right, about the love of money is what? It gives us a definition. What is the love of money? Defined by the Bible, it's the root of all evil. Is a, right. So is money evil? It never said money's evil. Right. So someone read that for us? Go ahead, Neela. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through which many sorrows. All right, so the sad result is sorrows. Do you think it's going to buy happiness? The Bible tells us otherwise. Sorrows. I don't want to even go down the Hollywood route, but people who you think have it all, have have it all, literally, the house, the cars. and the, My Bible says that that won't keep you happy because it says it could be filled with a life of sorrows. Why are people taking their own lives if they're so have it all? It, it's not the cure. There's still going to be a void. There's still going to be emptiness at the end of the day because the only joy and true peace is going to come through Christ Jesus. That's it. No money will solve that void or, or fill that void. Oh, Okay. All right, so if we look at um, um, number nine, what warning does the apostle give? And if you keep your finger there, and if you read the very next verse of 1 Timothy chapter 6, now verse 11, we're given counsel what to do. If you have a love for money, here's the antidote. But thou, O man of God, tells us this word, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And if you think about those things, those earthly treasures that he's telling us to seek for, a lot of times people don't seek for those things because it appears as if you have nothing to show for these things at the end of the day. It's almost as if humans need a tangible reminder of treasure. We need a tan. Why did right after Moses? Why did we start making it um, an idol? Why did we start doing the gold, uh, making a golden? We needed a reminder because they didn't have God's presence. I think as near to them where they felt like they wanted to create something you can see and touch and feel. And I guess the things like righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness is not outwardly. Um, It's almost like a mother's work in the house. You, you can do, it's like, the quote is, the mother's work is never done, right? So you do all these things, you keep the house in order, homeschool the children, all that, and at the end of the day, guess what? You wake up the next morning, you do it all over again. So it's almost like someone needs something to show them, like it has to count for something, and money, somehow tangible items will give you those reminders of, of a blessing, but I'd much rather be rich and increased with the things of his character, his righteousness, godliness. I'd rather be dead broke here on earth, struggle, and be rich in heavenly things uh, than the other way around. Um, so that, that would be, that answers question number uh, eight, no, sorry, nine. So what's the warning? To flee. Even the, I think even Hollywood knows that, um, Money doesn't keep you happy. Um, there was a rap 
a rap artist that said, more money, more problems. And that's actually somewhat, <laughs> if you look at the Bible and you think about if it's not used in the right way, if, if money gets in the wrong person's hands, because there's godly men who use money appropriately and they kept getting more, they were rich and increased with goods, but it's not that they didn't have need of nothing. They always had a reminder that they always depended every moment on God, that if he gives you all these things, just like that, like Job, it can be taken all away. And so it's a, we tend to think that we don't need to depend on him when we are increased with these goods. Sister, did you have a question? I was just going to say um, the remedy is, fl is to flee, but it's not just fleeing. It's a twofold remedy. It's Keep flee, going. fleeing and then following something else. Because a lot of times we take yes. something out. Yes. But we've got to fill it with something Amen. else. Amen. Amen. And if you go to the next verse, not just flee, follow, but it says, what's the other F word? Fight. Amen. So we're going to flee, follow, and fight. Ooh, I like that. We can make a sermon about that. <laughs> so you're to flee, you're to follow after what? These good things. That's your replacer when you take out stuff. And, and parents to their children, if you remove and forbid or take away stuff, please make... Please make Sabbath a delight. That's, I'll just leave it at that. Please fill it um, with something else. There's a lot of no's in life, and that's not a very appealing. So what, can, what are wholesome activities that will keep our youth not um, idle, but will give them some good, wholesome? We have to keep that going because I think they're targeted. The youth are targeted more than anyone. Um, but then lastly, uh, number verse 12, we have to fight the good fight of faith. Some people want to get a victory over sin, but they're not even in the fight to get victory. You can't win what you're not striving for. God won't do it for you. You have to also put forth some effort. He wouldn't have never parted that sea had Moses not taken that step of faith first. Um, so we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Are you going to get in the fight so I can finally <laughs> give you some blessings? But we have to put a, put a, prepare ourselves for battle. Um, okay, so let's go to uh, number 10. What kind of persons were to be chosen anciently as leaders amongst God's people? So let's go to Exodus 18 and verse 21. I think this kind of goes along with the theme. We know the answer to this question. If we did our lesson, it's going to be what type of people. And guess what? Just because... This says anciently leaders. I believe the leaders of this day, here and now, of our churches, I think that the same qualifications still apply. I don't feel that, that God doesn't change. And so if he wanted this specific type of leader then, it calls for that now in our churches. So what type of people are we looking for? Exodus 18.21, can I get a reader? Exodus 18.21 says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Okay, so they had to be what? Can you re do, just do the list? They had to be, qualification number one to be a leader of God was? They had to be able. Able, Okay. I think we're all able, okay, so I'm seeing, keep going. Uh, second one, they had to fear God. Okay, fear they God. They had to be men of truth. Okay. They had to hate covetousness. All right. Four qualifications, right? Okay. Um, just saying, same, same four. You know, we should really be measuring ourselves not among ourselves. Well, at least I'm not doing this. At least I'm... That's not our measuring stick. Get your eyes off each other. The Bible has our measuring stick. It's, the, it's Christ is where we should be comparing ourselves to. It's his words by this book. All right, so what does um, number 11, to whom do all things in the earth belong? We all know the answer to this. this is, none of this is ours. So uh, let's see. We're not going to go to all these scriptures. Um, because we were supposed to do our lesson all through the week, but you can read the first one. Go ahead and read the first one. Are we there? <laughs> Psalms 24? Yes, verse, verse number one. one. Okay. 
Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Amen. Um, since we're already in Psalm, can we also um, go to chapter 50? Psalm chapter 50, 9 through 12. Can I get a, another different reader? Go ahead, Sarai. You said 9 through 12? Yes, please. Okay. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he, nor he goat out of thy fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Amen. What happens is, we're, we forget that we're stewards. That um, There's parables, many parables, where here's your talent. What are you doing with your talent? Is it going to be to serve self, to make money, to make a name for yourself, to be re have a reputation? Or what? how are you stewarding your the, the talent? The might that the widow put in, if she stewarded that selfishly, do you think the Lord would give her more? But if she had her, her one talent she cast in, by faith, that's, that thing is going to multiply. Um, so if you want bigger, better, pray bigger, better. But then the Lord is going to say, have you been faithful in that which is least? Sometimes when you pray for the wrong thing, that, that, that the Lord knows if you get that thing, it's going to do harm, more damage than good. He's going to tell, tell you no out of love. But then that's where we have to say, have I wasted money? Have I wasted my words? Have I wasted my time and not used? These are all talents, by the way. They're gifts. Even temporal life itself is a gift. He, it's borrowed. We don't have to have life. It's not guaranteed every single day we wake up and we breathe. That's a gift. Every morning you wake up and you can move, that's a gift. And those gifts are, are taken for granted, unfortunately. But if we use everything so carefully and we're faithful stewards, I believe the Lord is just waiting to give us even more. Okay, so let's go to uh, Luke chapter 19 and verse 13. So let's go to Luke. And the question is, what is man's relationships to all these things? What is you and my, our relationship to all these things that don't belong to us, but belong to the Lord? We do have a relationship to these things, because are we not living here on earth with things? It's not saying don't have anything, but there is something we are to do. And that something is in Luke 19. And verse number 13, Luke 19, verse 13, it's in red. So Christ is speaking. What are we to do? What's man's relationships to all these things that belong to the Lord? And he called his son ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Is that the one? So, no. yes. Okay. It is. Amen. So what's our relationship to things? We occupy. What does that mean? I have to live. That means we, we need our needs taken care of while we're here on earth, right? We are still to have to get by with things. So things do have a purpose. It's not wrong to have things, but it's to occupy. It's to, we're supposed to live in health. We are, you know, we have jobs and you know there's things in the day that we have to still live so it's not to empty and have nothing we got we have to have provisions day by day and that's where our relationship with us and things i use things to have a quality of life here on earth while i'm waiting for christ's coming not that this is my end all be all home because i know i'm a pilgrim and I'm just passing through temporarily. But while I'm here and while I'm occupying, do we need things? Yes. As long as we don't think we love these things so much that we can take them with us to heaven. If we get attached to things, I just use the things to keep for its purpose. It's temp temporal needs to be taken care of. That's it. 
Okay, so let's go on to uh, Leviticus. Let's go Old Testament. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 27. Leviticus, chapter 27, and verse number 30 through 33, talking about tithe, holy unto the Lord. Is the title of my Bible. So Leviticus 23, 30 through 33, how much of all we have is holy to the Lord? Is this some of the things holy? All of our things holy? How much of all we have is holy to the Lord? What, what belongs to him? It's all his, so we can't just say a small percentage is his. It's all his, 100% is his. But then this question is saying, how much of all we have is holy to the Lord? Holy, H-O-L-Y, that type of holy. Okay, someone read that for me, please. And all of the tide of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the foot of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem out of his tide, he shall add therefore, or thereto, the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tide of the herd or the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. Amen. So what happens if we withhold and rob God of that which that, of tithes and offerings? Is there, is there anything that can be done to reconcile that? Add how much? Amen. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> they say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, and they'll pray, pray for forgiveness, but they don't know the harder part. What's harder, to pray for forgiveness or to go restore and make that which is right? That's going to that's gonna hurt if you let that go because it's unfaithful. It's unfaithful. And so it should, you should feel a little bit of sense of um, uncomfortableness. You shouldn't be having a life of ease because you'll repeat that thing. If you're not made to feel some type of consequence, parents, don't feel guilty when you correct your children. When they grow up, they're going to thank you for not being spoiled. And they may not put it together, but God, are we not God's children? Does he want to spoil brats as kids? No, he wants us to learn. So he says, this is good for you. God doesn't need our money, but he knows our character we need to show our faithfulness in giving back what, what is rightfully his. So to pray and say, Lord, forgive me for robbing you of tithes and offerings. Yes, that's necessary, but that's just one part. We stop there, and we don't want to do the next step because it hurts. It's uncomfortable when you have to reach in, and when you don't have it, but you spent it, and you have to reach in and give to the Lord, and now you have to add more to it, a fifth part on top of that which you withheld. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I, you know, I, it's interesting because I, I was studying this um, several months back, and it's talking about redeeming. When you lo really look at that, um, and I don't want to kind of divert, but when you look at that, it's, it's talking about buying something back. So um, in their day, they, you know, they had grain, they had flock, mm -hmm. they had those things. Um, and when they wanted to redeem it, they would, um, instead of giving, let's say, for example, just for a crude example, a tenth was a pound of grain. Mm -hmm. In order to redeem that, um, they would give money instead so that they can keep it and plant with it, but then they'd have to give another 5% on top. Not that they were taking God's tithe and using it and saying, okay, now I'm going to give them extra 5%. Okay, okay. There, there, there was no, from my understanding, no, what's the word, um, provision mm. for using God's tithe. Mm. It was a redemption because they were doing an exchange right there. That's oh, my understanding. Okay, that. that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I would love to do, yeah, I would like to, I think that could yeah. go further with that, that topic. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that, and I never heard it like that before. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that is... Um, a tenth is, the, to answer that part of the question, a tenth is what uh, is holy unto the Lord. So that brings us to um, 
number 14. In, in four more questions, and we're closing up. Number 14, let's go to Malachi. We say this a lot. We should have this memorized because every Sabbath, right before the collection, we know the book of Malachi. So let's go to the last book of the Old Testament. In our Bibles, Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. Malachi 3 and verse 8. I can get a reader. The question is, what charge does the Lord bring against his people? Okay, Malachi 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Amen. So if you look at note number 5, I saw that many who profess to be keeping the commandments of God are appropriating to their own use the means which the Lord has in, entrusted to them, that which should come into his treasury. They rob God in tithes and in offerings. They dissemble and withhold from him to their own hurt. You can't get ahead. If you rob God, you will have holes in your pocket, I promise. People do this to get ahead or to hoard, and they end up in the hole worse off than they had started from. Uh, they bring leanness and poverty upon themselves. Don't think there's always poverty when someone is poor. It's just because bad luck fell upon them. Sometimes it's to their own doing. And darkness upon the church. Because of their covetousness, they're dissembling, and they're robbing God in tithes and offerings. So the Lord says that we're robbing him of both things. It's not just the tenth, because he wouldn't have put the word in their offerings if it just stops at that one tenth. So let's quickly go to uh, question number 15. What is the sad result of robbing God? I think we kind of know this, right? You're either going to get blessings or you're going to get... Go to verse 9 in that same Malachi 3. Karen read verse 8. If someone can read the very next verse right there. And you're going to stay there. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, if you can also, someone read the next verse after that, 10 and 11. What blessing is promised to those who repent? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, you said something that really stood out in that um, scripture, and that was proof. To me, proof came out. We cut the check in Sabbath, here's my tithes. It's almost like a routine. But are we really taking God at his word and proving? You have not because you ask not. That's what my Bible says. Are we proving God? That's not showing you don't have faith. That's not saying, oh, if I ask him to, if I put out a fleece and I'm asking him if you will multiply it, is that showing that I don't have faith in God? No, it's not showing. He asked you to prove him. Prove him. It's to increase our faith. God doesn't need our money but it's to show our faith, to walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, you guys were giving a lot of testimonies last, uh, last time about you should, when, you, when you shouldn't have made it some months that you were really dry and you look at your bank account and logically when you run the numbers, I must have made a mistake and you run the numbers again, there's no way you should have been able to pay and cover your bills. And then a check comes in your mail because God hears your prayers. Why is that? Because you're f of our faithfulness. Prove God. Don't sell yourself short. You have not because you ask not. Ask, seek, and not. And see whether these things are so. Let's take God at his word. Okay, so if you go, for, go to Proverbs, this is our last and final uh, scripture. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 28, Psalms, Proverbs, 28, and verse number 
16, The Prince. Does someone want to read that? The Prince? The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. So what's the blessing of hating covetousness? The blessing is you will have prolonged days. Is there, a, is there a commandment that also talks about you can lengthen your life? There you go. Right. So if you're faithful and you're honoring your, your mother and your father, this is the only other one that I've heard of that talked about living a long life. I'm like, wow, I only knew about the honoring the mother and the father part. But this one, if you're hating covetousness, um, you will prolong your days. You want to shorten your life and be unhappy? Be covetous. Always want something that is not yours. Always desire. Keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know how to say it, but when everyone is... I want this, and he, this brother has this, and comparing ourselves among ourselves, you will be miserable because that's not the lot that the Lord has given you. Be happy and take him, and to, uh, cherish what he's given us. He's given you this spouse, you this children, you this car, this house. Treasure that. Don't want what's not yours. Eve, I have all these trees, but I want this one. Covetousness. I wanted to uh, tell you uh, about, you know, like it's really, last night I had, um, I went to see this family. Uh, be, uh, let me just go back uh, so that you have the, um, you know, the context of the story. Um, one of our, our, my director of nursing in her family, we had a study the other Friday. And uh, we had, anyhow, the children enjoyed the study. They said that they have not, they have never opened the Bible. That was their first time to open the Bible. And they enjoyed it. We'd, we actually had studied a, a while. I think it's more than an hour. But they thought that it's just, oh, we finished? They said, <laughs> but I said, I don't want to give a lot more information because yeah, I want to give much. what you can ponder, yeah, right. you know. So anyhow, the mother um, told me this week, I, actually last week already, preparing me for yesterday, she wanted me to go to this uh, boy because this boy uh, is challenged. You know, he's only 14 years old. His name is Luke. Um, he's in the psych unit right now mm. because he he lost his brain. How old is he? 14. Oh. He's he's uh, he's seeing things, meaning that he's uh, showing uh, signs of schizophrenia and bipolar. Right. So uh, she said, "Why don't you pray for them?" We'll just uh, pray. We don't have to study. We just have to pray. So I, last night I went to their home. Can you believe I was when I went to when I came home after the study in, in prayer, I told my husband, man, these people's home is so beautiful, so beautiful, mm. you know. And uh, and then according to the mom, when I talked to her, she said, you know, like she acquire, acquire, acquire. For the children, you know, you want the children to have everything that you never had. But the problem is, and but I, I told her that our children, they need the stuff. They need it, but they need us more. Mm, so time. we have to give more of us mm. to our children. That's why, you know, like um, when you see people that are very rich, never in envy them. You don't know what they're going you through. Don't know. You don't know. When the people of God are rich, the people that are, you know, faithful to him, you know that that's a blessing from God. Mm -hmm. Then you praise God. But people that you do not know, you don't say a word, <laughs> I guess, uh, to me, that is. Because you don't know what that, wh where those money are coming from. Look at this, the boy. But anyhow, tonight I'm going to see the boy. I'm going to pray with the boy. And, uh, and then the, 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 the eldest son, because we prayed last night in, in, in their house, and we, I read to them Psalms 91, uh, James, you know, like you pray. And you didn't, you know those things. So anyhow, uh, they want me to come tonight and, and pray with the with the boy. I was gonna go last night, but I forgot my ID, so the the hospital did not let me in. So I'm just saying that you know, like you cannot covet other people's whatever they have. That's theirs. Don't covet. You don't even know how they acquire. You know, you don't know how 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 it is. Like. I would, you know, now the mom is saying she would exchange anything for that boy not to be like that. The reason why, then I go back, and then the reason why is that 
She's acquiring, acquiring, right? She's happy that the boy and the children are not bothering her. They're not asking for this. They're not, you know, they're content. In her mind, they're content. The boy was playing game all day long, all night long. That's what messed up his mind. Mm. He's always playing, playing, playing to the point that the boy is not eating anymore. He's not eating, he's not drinking, whatever she brings to the boy in the room. She doesn't even eat, she doesn't even drink. So you know, when your brain is a lack of, of food, nutrition, and water, something happens, you know. So uh, that's why the Bible is right, you know, like we cannot covet other people's. We, you know, if you go through the Bible, a lot of people of God are very rich because they are very faithful. You know, they're very faithful in their tithings and in all of these things. And, and God blessed them. But, you know, we have an enemy too that can make you feel like you're blessed, although you are not. Mm -hmm. You can't covet. You just have to be close to God all the time. Amen. Amen. You know, and, and we're getting into a holiday. My favorite holiday of the year is coming up, Thanksgiving. And it just makes you feel a sense of gratitude having an attitude of gratitude and really being thankful. And we're supposed to keep a journal and a record, do you know that? Of every prayer you prayed, and the Lord has actually brought that thing to pass. Why? Again, here goes back to that children of Israel, us too, we're forgetful. Mm -hmm. So we have to review that thing, because when we get in our pity party state, and woe is me, and my life is all this, and we get wrapped up in our own troubles, we are to open that book and remember how the Lord has answered one prayer after another after another. A gratitude journal, a gratitude book. Amen. I wanted to just share this yeah. other verse that talks about how we can lengthen our days. Oh, is there it's another one? It's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Okay, hold on. Proverbs chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there's, I want a long life, so let's see. I want to see the secrets. Proverbs 3 and what? Verse 1 and 2. Oh, okay. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Amen. So what do we have? Honoring the mother and the father. We have uh, keeping the commandments, which also includes that, that honoring of father and mother. And then hating covetedness as well, which is all, they're all entwined in his law, which his law is his what? His character. So everything, if you want long life have his law what's his law have his character having a character means long life having his character the fruit of the spirit will manifest outwardly that you are god commanding commandment keeping people you can't profess to keep the commandments and not have any fruit to show because by your fruits we shall know them we know what side of the fence you're on by the fruits you're manifesting they will show forth go ahead sister and i just want to uh, also what's the meaning of long life if you have a miserable life. Mm. But look at what it says. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, correct, right? That's true. For length of days and long life and peace there they shall go. add to there thee. You, go. you know? That's right. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, sister. Amen. One thing I wanted to point out in that scripture uh, that Sister Disson brought out, do you guys catch that first part? It says, but let thine heart keep my commandments. It's not what you're doing so much as to your key. How do you hide his law in your heart? You're, if you're meditating on his word, in the last days, we don't have to fumble for the right answer when we're brought before the rulers to give an answer for our faith. He will send the Holy Spirit, and out of your mouth, you just open it, and all that you're filling in now, right now, will come out in the perfect word structure, vocabulary. He will give you the words to speak. But if we're not feeling it now, our minds, you keeping his commandment in your mind, that's how you're able to commit adultery. I said this before. You can commit adultery with never have touched another woman because you lust after her. The only thing stopping between you and doing that act is an opportunity because if you had a moment, you would act on it. That's how you're able to commit adultery. And I never touched her because why? The sin originates in our mind. It starts with that lustful thought. And, if, and I promise you, if we're not rebuking that thought in Jesus' name and asking God to get that out of our mind, it's only a matter of time. What did Achan do? We just talked about it. It was three steps that we talked about. Achan did what? He saw all these things, 
Then what was the third thing he did? Or second thing, he coveted this. And the last and final straw was it just took an action. He sealed that, that thought with a deed. Commandments are kept in our mind because that scripture just says that. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for each other um, that we will be faithful. Think about all the things that we do input, all the sensory input um, throughout the day. I, I pray that we will fill um, our hearts with more of his work, less talking about us, less talking about our problems, less and more talking of Jesus. Take our eyes off of us and stop being so selfish and look to his misery because when we compare our problems with what Christ bore, it's, we don't stand, there's no comparison. It makes us feel that our problems are so small in comparison. And so uh, let us have a word of prayer um, as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this uh, study, Lord, and I pray, Father, that you will help us to truly treasure all the blessings that you bestowed upon us and help us to be faithful in even the small things, Lord, so that you can truly entrust us as your faithful servants to give us and bless us even more. Father, help us to just live up to the light that you've given us and to be faithful and pray for one another more often, Father, to take our eyes off of self. I pray that we will be emptied and filled with your Holy Spirit that we will long and be faithful and wait for Christ's soon coming, that we will not be caught unawares. Let us get our home in order. Let us get our house in order. Father, let us do all things to glorify you so we will be prepared to enter into the pearly gates of your heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name.